Let me just remind you of where we've been in Mark's Gospel. What happens in this section, this huge section of Mark, from 3.13 to 6.6, where so much happens fast, and that's great with Mark, isn't it? Love Mark for that, so much happens fast. There's been the appointing of the twelve apostles to take the message of the kingdom from the first chapter out into the world. So this message that Jesus comes to bring is the kingdom of God is at hand. That is the first big deal. And we, we, we gloss over that in the way we communicate with people. The kingdom of God is at hand. God is calling people to account. Okay? The time is, you know, the monkey's got to the end of the chain and he's about to pull you back. Right? So now's the time to turn back before it hurts your neck. Okay? The appointing of the twelve goes with that. That's the message to go out. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, believe the gospel. Come follow me, says Jesus. I'll make you fishers of men. And then he appoints twelve to lead that mission. That was an interesting one, one sentence summary of the beginning of Mark's gospel. There it is for you. Somebody write that down. As soon as those twelve are appointed and the mission begins, there's opposition. And it comes from the places you'd really not expect it most perhaps. <coughs> It comes from your immediate family, it comes from the religious leaders of the day, and then it comes from the family again. Trying to belittle, trying to call to account, trying to dismiss, trying to write off. And the response to that opposition, to the gospel of the kingdom that's come out, is Jesus teaches four parables and does four miracles. And the whole thing ends with a fresh opposition from the family again. Yeah? Even in the light of the power of the word of God, even in the light of the power of the Lord himself, the opposition continues. Expect, if you're signing up for this kingdom, if you're signing up for its mission in the world, opposition comes to that. And bear in mind we're being told that because Peter and Mark from Peter is writing for the sake of believers in Rome. And we saw last time the historical times in which they were set, that long reign of Nero, the year of the five emperors, and then, you know, nothing much better to look forward to. So, um, that's what this is all about. And we're back outside in the sunlight again today, having looked at the parable of the sower last time. And then looked at the parable of the lamp last time, rather. We looked at the parable of the sower a week before. Then last time we looked at the parable of the lamp. It was evening, it was indoors, the lamp was lit. Don't believe on the basis of the opposition this gospel meets this mission this message meets don't believe you to sort of keep it quiet and put it under a, a cover of some sort the light is to be put on the lampstand so it can give light to the whole house in spite of the opposition in spite of what comes at you for doing so making sense okay so having done the parable of the lamp indoors of an evening we're back outside again in the fields with the seed growing secretly chapter 4 verses 26 to 29 jesus moves that uh, discussion about um, spreading the light the ch church and people of God to spread the light and he moves that forward we must never be discouraged from exhibiting and shining the light never be discouraged from doing that because of the hiddenness of the work of God in the world when God works in the world it's, it's, it's not you know placarded or as, as public as the messaging needs to be the messaging goes out and the work goes on underneath quietly secretly in people's hearts People don't wear their hearts on their sleeves. You don't know. But the word goes out publicly and the work of God continues, sort of, not covert, well, covertly, yeah, undercover, in that sense. Do you see what I mean? Don't be discouraged because you're not seeing fantastic, big, slap bang, wallop stuff going on because the work of God persists and is pursued quietly undercover. Because if you stop exhibiting the word, if you stop putting the lamp on the stand, what happens is that you lose what you've already got and we just looked at that last time in terms of what's been happening in Wales in the last 50 70 years if you don't keep on with that you lose it shine the light or it's snuffed out now Jesus moves that discussion about the power of the word working secretly he moves it forward by using this little aphorism of the seed that grows secretly. The sowing must be done openly and publicly, but the growing, the taking root and all that, it happens way behind the scenes. So we're back outside again. He also said, the kingdom of God is like someone who spreads seed on the ground. When he spread it in the daylight, he goes home, he goes to sleep and gets up night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. 
Sowing, the message of the kingdom, is essential to the kingdom of God. So essential. But it needs to be done faithfully and diligently, regardless of immediately observable results. We need to get that through to our generation. Maybe we need to get that through to ourselves. The sowing must go ahead, regardless of what immediately observable results there are or are not. Because that's how seed works. Did you ever plant mustard and press seed on a bit of cloth for your kids and stick it on the kitchen window? And, and were they there sort of every half hour standing on the stool and peering across to see if it was growing? Yeah. Did you ever do that? Watch their little faces climbing on the chair to examine their non-crop as it sat there motionless above the kitchen sink on the windowsill. Yeah. Done all that? Been there, done that, got the scars. And then when it finally grows, magic! Yeah. Get up one morning and it's split, there's a little thing sticking up. Yeah, fantastic. Magic because we've got no idea how. By itself, the soil produce first, oh, produces a crop. First the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. And I've made a mistake on the slide, which you can now see. The trouble with being a minister and a preacher is that all your mistakes are public, yeah? Well, not all of them, thankfully, but a lot of them. Um, by itself, the soil produces a crop, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. By itself. You just, you see, you do this daft thing. You throw this precious seed onto the ground. It looks like the daftest place to keep it safe, where it gets trodden on, and it gets cold at night, and it gets wet in the rain, and it rots into the damp, fecund earth. Fecund, that's a good word for a Sunday morning. It means sort of fertile. And we don't go back digging it up to see how it's getting on. We sow it and we leave it alone. It's committed into hands that don't always look safe, but that are safer than ours. And by itself, says Jesus, it does the seemingly impossible. So we go to youth club and we get the Bible out. Well, we might not get the Bible out, we might get the phone out these days because it does look a lot cooler, doesn't it? And as you know, I'm very cool. And uh, here we go, we, we sort of chuck the word into the, into the arena with those little lions and they, they sort of roar at it and stamp on it and chuck it around and play with it. And, yeah, and you think, oh, the authority of the word of God is not being respected in this place. No, but the seed is in the ground. Or you go into the mart, or you go into wherever it is you meet people, or burger vans, wherever it is you meet people, and, and you just quietly just slip little bits of God's word into the conversation, and they turn, they stamp, and there are pigs about, and they, you know, pearls, you think, and pigs. How do we distinguish that line between seed in the ground and pearls to pigs? It's part of the battle. But the thing we can't afford to do is to stop throwing the seed in the ground. Because we haven't seen something happen immediately or maybe for many years. One rotted little seed trampled on produces a stalk. And what it produces looks nothing like what we sowed. There was no stalk in the seed. There was no grain in the head. We did what we'd been told to do with the seed. And in spite of appearance or reasonable expectation from what we'd done, by just sowing and waiting, we finally see what God can do. Can you see what's coming out of that seed? There's an oak tree coming out of that seed on the wall. Looks nothing like what you put there. Proportionately, it is so much bigger, more stable, stronger, whatever. Isn't it great when people that you know and you've shared Christ with and you've when they start doing things that you look at and you say, my, isn't that great? What a work of God. I couldn't have done that. Isn't that great? I've just tried to get through to young people uh, over many, many years doing young people's work and so on and, and young Christians and stuff and the kids and you know, we really want them to be making a better job of things than we do. We, we haven't done our job if they're not making a better job of it than we've made of it. D does that make sense? Well, <clears throat> just so and wait and finally you see what God can do, you know? When the grain is ripe, he sends in the sickle because the harvest has come. I found a nice scything photo for you there from somewhere else in the world. Oh, it's, it's sickling, isn't it? It's uh, hooking with a hook and then cutting with a sickle. Yeah? See that? Someone in the Middle East, I expect. Mustn't, mustn't turn into the scything geek in the, in the congregation as well. God is the one who makes the harvest. It isn't the seed company. 
It isn't the genetic engineers who fiddled with it. It isn't the pesticide manufacturer. It isn't the combine harvester builders. Humanity's got its part to play with sowing and reaping, but the harvest comes from and belongs to the Lord. His people must just go on throwing in the seed. His people must just go on proclaiming his kingdom. And it sometimes looks like such an inadequate response to the mess of our world as we see it. But Jesus is coming to that because he's going to go next to the example of the mustard seed. He also asked, verse 30, Mark 4, to what can we compare the kingdom of God? What parable can we use to present it? Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God back in easily interpreted but mission-protecting code again. He's back to parables. So what can we compare the kingdom of God? This isn't the kingdom of God, he says. You know, it's not salvation through agriculture, right? This is salvation through the preaching of the message of the kingdom of God and the fruit being brought about by God. What can we compare it to? What parable can we use for this purpose? We've spoken before about why he's doing this in parables and, and you just have to refer to the previous occasions. He is describing that which is unknown in terms of things that are actually known. And here comes the point he is making. It is like a mustard seed that when sown in the ground, even though it is the smallest of all the seeds in the ground, when it is sown, it grows up. It grows up. I found you a nice picture of, with a scale on it of 20 mil. That, that, those, between those are 20 millimetres. And that's how small your mustard seeds are. the smallest seed known to the guys around at the time. The seed grows secretly, we've seen that, but it looks like absolutely nothing that you're throwing on the ground as you plant it. It looks like nothing, that's inconsequential. Why are you bothering with that? What's the point of that? You go around talking to people about Jesus all the time. Why do you put all this time and effort into preaching God's word to people? Why do you do that? It's pointless. It looks small and inconsequential. It looks small and inconsequential. And of course the world's problems seem vast. And the troubles that non-Christian friends share with us look just enormous. And we're to turn to them and say something like this. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Come and follow Jesus with me. And show that by becoming yourself a fisher of men. And that heals them. I know it sounds ridiculous, it sounds too small, it sounds like, that's not, what's that going to do? How on earth is that going to help the person at their wit's end with their family, financial, emotional, health problems, who's melting into tears on my sofa? Much and in every way. Because we deal with the issues that we've got in fellowship with the living God, and those issues are a different kettle of fish altogether. Because we were not made to deal with the things that life in a fallen world throws up in isolation. You cannot do that. It will mess you up. But in fellowship with the living God, that's a completely different ball game. Am I telling you that? You know that. Does anybody else want to say that better, to say it better than me? I mean, some of you can. But ain't that the truth? When that seed is sown, it grows up, and the fruit of that is life lived in fellowship with the one true living God who enables us, empowers us, directs us. When that relevant sentence that you've uttered, when that poignant word that you've just left there, like a seed on the ground, when that wise aphorism or saying is planted in the mind and the heart of the soul soil that God prepares, that little thing grows into a bush. Ah, the good old bush. A good old bush. <coughs> Illustrations. Uh, one of my farmers I get on reasonably well with, actually, um, standing with him recently in a machine resale, and he used, let's say, a few profane, profane expressions. And, and then he realised what he'd done, and he apologised profusely. Oh, sorry, I forgot what you do. Like, um, So what am I going to say next? Well, I never swear. Because that's what he's expecting from me. There is simply no need for that sort of language. Because that's what he's expecting from me. Or maybe, 
If you were a real Christian, you'd never do that. That's what he's expecting. Because that's what he's been led to expect. But there is mustard seed here to be sown. Tiny little thing. Tiny little bit. It's not me you want to say sorry to. I'm as bad a man as you. But it's my boss who is always there looking and listening to you. He's the one we all need to say sorry to. All the time. Now what doctrines have we conveyed there for those who are into that sort of thing? We, we all should be. What doctrines have we conveyed? We have conveyed the universal total depravity of human nature in consequence of the fall. We've conveyed the, the urgent necessity, the universal urgent necessity of regeneration. Repentance, returning to God in view of his all-seeing eye and his incoming kingdom for the forgiveness of our sin, which we acknowledge freely before him. Haven't we? It sounds better when you wrap it up in big words, but it's just a little seed. A little mustard seed. Thrown on the ground. Don't keep it in your pocket because it looks so small. Throw it out on the ground and, it, you know, God willing, it's going to grow big. God can make little stuff like that really grow. i been doing that in bandit with another guy for a few years who, surprisingly, I'm afraid, wanted to talk about his failing health and mortality just last week comes to fruit over a cup of tea or leaning on a gate or on their deathbed do you know when that guy wanted to talk just, just the other week um, may the Lord forgive my surprise I should have known better we've been sowing there for years and there's been nothing to see let me tell you on the surface of the soil until now may God save that man because that seed needs to germinate well and it needs to make a bush. And if that bush comes up, there's going to be some birds of the air looking for a bit of shelter in that one, let me tell you. When it is sown, it grows up, becomes the greatness of all garden plants and grows large branches so that the wild birds can nest in its shade. That's a terrific translation, I love it. Okay, I'm not going to go on about that. There are birds that need to find rest, okay? in its shade not just in mine and the translation we got there wild birds is a translation of something that more literally means the birds of the air now you get all sorts of birds don't you you know you get chicken yeah they're domesticated birds parrots pet birds yeah it's legitimate they're all birds yeah but he's talking about the birds of the air he's talking about the wild ones He's talking about the ones that go their own way and do their own thing. And, you know, life is risky and precarious. Yeah? What sort of people find rest in Christ when his followers faithfully do their master's seed sowing, regardless of the fact that nothing appears, regardless of the fact that it, it feels dangerous, regardless of the fact you feel stupid sometimes? The wild birds find their rest in Christ. Worth it then, isn't it? That's worth it. We're coming to the end of this section of parables. We said there's a panel of parables there, and we said there's a section of you know the mighty works of God, Jesus doing miracles. So we've got the opposition, we've got the, taking the kingdom out. What's going to come of that opposition? What's going to? How do you need to understand that? You need to understand that in terms of the lamp. If there's opposition. If it doesn't seem to get anywhere, put the lamp on the stand and let it shine. Don't put it under a bushel. Why am I using the authorized version again? Basket, right? Growing seed, okay, well, you know, it, it doesn't look like anything's going to happen, but all of a sudden it grows quietly, even though you can't see anything happening, and all of a sudden, bush, mustard seed. It looks so small, so tiny, so inconsequential, this preaching of the kingdom of God, just do it, do it, and you grow bushes out of which, in, into which the birds of the air, the wild ones, come find their rest in Christ. Now we just need to have a little quiet word again about the point of parables. We need this quiet word about the point of parables because, well, with many parables like these, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately explained everything to his own disciples. We looked at the reasons why he's having to use parables. Coming to the end of this section, 
majored in parables about this contrast between the apparent weakness and nothingness of the word of God, but the actual power of proclaiming God's word, the good news of the kingdom, sharing it in little ways wherever, whenever we can. And Jesus in his time is so threatened and so persecuted himself for the saving truth he comes bringing that he has to cover his message in enigma. It's called the messianic secret. But it's the sort of secret as Dick Franz says, as we saw it before, it's the sort of secret that you make up if you're the person running the treasure hunt. You know, you use secrets that are designed to be discovered, but you've got to think about it. Privately, then, he unpacks those to his genuine followers, his own disciples. And we tend to think we need to set the meaning of our message so close to the surface for unbelievers. Don't we? We've got to dumb it down and make it simple so they can't miss it. Well, there's an element of that. <coughs> In fact, a lot of ministry goes like this, and I criticise myself as much as anybody else. We tend to think we need to set the meaning of our message close to the surface for unbelievers, but as far from the surface as possible to the insiders who come along on a Sunday morning by making our sermons as obscure as possible. Yeah, you know I'm right about that, don't you? <laughs> That's what happens. Jesus in the Gospels sets about things by doing the complete opposite. He makes it slightly obscure. So if you're not a believer yet, you've got to give the Gospel some thought. But when it comes to his followers, those who are living on and going to communicate the Gospel, he makes it as absolutely crystal clear as possible. Does that make sense? Can you see what I'm getting at? Now, I don't know what the answer to that is, and I don't know where we're going with that, but it's an observation, and I think it's something we've got to think about. So, never be afraid of using unpackable, so you can get to it, but you've got to think about it, enigma, to engage the thoughts and the hearts of the unconverted. Not many people will show you that in the Bible, but I just did, and you can check through Proverbs, and you can check through all sorts of examples of, you know, um, uh, we can go back to Samson yeah? but God's truth is being wrapped in an enigma to get people to go and think about that but it's made very plain for those on the inside so there's no avoiding the truth that they believe <coughs> okay conclusion is that good lunch probably won't burn Paul's on his way up to uh, up to Jerusalem. I'm going to tell you a story because there's a need. So Paul's on his way up to Jerusalem and he's facing incredible danger in obedience to Christ in proclaiming the gospel. Right? This is, this is the area we've been in, isn't it? With the coming of the gospel of the kingdom, the message has got to be proclaimed, there'll be opposition. That's what Jesus has been dealing with. So here's Paul living it. And he's on his way up to Jerusalem facing incredible danger in obedience to Christ and he stops at a place called Miletus, a seaport on the way. And he's not going to travel up through the hinterland again or up to Ephesus. He sends for the elders of the church in Ephesus to come to him. Now, Ephesus is a fascinating church. It's a tremendous case study on how to do rural mission, but that's another day. It was a strategic, nurturing, missional, city centre church. It was a crucial church. It was a strategic church. There was a thriving port metropolis and, and centre of the entire region in terms of governance and trade and economy and everything else. And the church in that place had supported the mission that saw churches planted in Colossae and Laodicea and throughout the Lycus Valley, in, in fact, throughout the entire region, from all the towns and the villages that journeyed down the trade routes from the hinterland into the big city. Now that church there was a crucial strategic church. It had its moments, but it was possibly the biggest success story of Paul's apostolic ministry because it's the missional church planting churches. And he'd been there for years, and it had gone on for years, and the ministry had been sustained there for years. The Apostle John went there, you know, to, after Paul, when Paul lost his head. And it was all, you know, it was a thriving, important, missional place. So Paul knows he's going up to Jerusalem. This is his last occasion when he can speak to those leaders of that church. What did he have to say to the elders from Ephesus when they came down to meet Paul? Knowing this was almost certainly farewell to a man who was going to his death in the service of Christ. What did he have to say to them? Guys, play down a bit because it's a bit dodgy. You know, you, you could end up in real trouble. Guys, don't make yourselves look daft. Now, there's big philosophers and people around the place, okay? Just keep, make you look intelligent, okay? Look complicated. 
He said, you yourselves know how I lived the whole time while I was with you, from the first day I set foot in the province of Asia. For, you know, this is my example, this is how we live. Serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with the trials that happened to me because of the plots of the Jews. There's opposition to living a gospel life. Now get this. There's opposition to living a gospel life you know, verse 20 of Acts 20, you know that I did not hold back from proclaiming to you anything that will be helpful and from teaching you publicly and from house to house, testifying to both Jews and Greeks about repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus. The essential gospel stuff. I didn't hold back. Bang on with that. And there were riots in Ephesus, you know. Now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem without knowing what will happen to me there. Don't know. Except that the Holy Spirit warns me in town after town that imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me. So we bang on with the gospel. Oh, keep quiet. You know, stop sowing. No, 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 no. That's not how the gospel works. That's not how the kingdom of God works. I do not consider my life worth anything to myself, says Paul, so that I may finish my task and the ministry I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. This is why we're here. This is the safe way. This is the eternally safe way. I'm not going to see any of you again, he says. I'm paraphrasing that bit for you. Summarizing, let's say. I declare to you today, he goes on and says, that I am innocent of the blood of you all. What, what, what was that? I am not responsible if any of you comes to grief. Why? Because I did not hold back from announcing to you the whole purpose of God. I'm innocent of your blood. And he says, watch out for yourselves. And he says, watch out for the flock of which God has made you, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Do not hold back on this preaching of the kingdom. From your own group, people are going to arise and there'll be wolves in sheep's clothing and they'll try and draw the flock off and damage the flock of God. Persist in preaching this gospel of this kingdom. Do not hold back. Be alert. Remember, three years, I didn't stop warning you, day and night. And now he says, I entrust you to God. Here's the safe way. Here's how I can have peace about everything that's going to happen to you, everything you're going to do and face in the service of this gospel, this kingdom, preaching this message the way Jesus has been telling us in Mark's gospel. And trust you to God and the message of his grace. This message is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Don't hold back. That isn't the safe way. That isn't the safe way. Paul is facing eternity himself with confidence and he's facing eternity that's going to come on them and the trouble that's going to come on them with confidence. How is he doing that? He's devoted himself to ministering God's word to them in ways that are self-sacrificing and God-honouring. And that is his confidence. That is his confidence in the face of the first light of eternity, just before eternity seems about to dawn over his soul. So the question for us is, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with it? John Piper wrote a book a little while ago, and it's become famous, and it's gone the rounds, and it's been everywhere. You know, don't waste your life. <laughs> Good title for a book, isn't it? Don't waste your life. I could sell that book almost anywhere, I think. <laughs> don't waste your life. What? It's what we're afraid of doing, isn't it? Wasting your life. It's what everybody's afraid of doing. So when you get to my age, what have I done with my life? Well, there's some answers. I, there are some answers. But, but that's in your mind. Don't waste your life. What Paul's done with his life and what he continues to do with his life guarantees it's not a waste because Paul has been giving time every day of his life to doing stuff that's going to last forever. And he's leaving behind him the Ephesian elders. Man alive. Oh, I'm innocent of the blood of all men because I haven't hidden the light, he says. God's given the light. I haven't hidden it. I've displayed it. Yeah, it's a bit of grief. But 
he hasn't reckoned that because he doesn't understand how the seed grows secretly, he shouldn't show it, shouldn't sow it. And he hasn't disdained to cast something as small as mustard seed into the ground. He sown what he was entrusted with because he knew he could trust God that God would bring harvest out of it. Listen, it's like this. God has ordained that through the foolishness of that which was preached, mankind should be saved. See? And I can think of far better marketing strategies. I can think of far more effective looking marketing strategies. We can think of far cooler, far more intellectually respectable or self-aggrandizing things to do, like keep quiet about Jesus, for example. But that is the way, as Jesus has been saying in these parables, to have even what you have removed from you. And church history and Wales's modern history is littered with examples who decided the best thing was to keep kind of quiet about this gospel, who've had even what they had removed from them, and their temples and their tabernacles are, are carpet warehouses in the valleys. See, it is always easy to look at the apparent weakness of what we've got in our hand, to set about serving God's kingdom with, and, and, and to despair that these things will ever turn the tide. They do. Over against that, it is the quiet power of the word of God that gets emphasised time and again in this bit of Mark's gospel. Faith is what trusts God to do the saving, then. And persevering steadily with, with human endeavours that, that seem utterly inadequate to the task, that is called faith. That is trusting him to do it. That's what faith is. And glory is what God gets when he uses those weak human means to achieve the salvation of souls and bring God's kingdom in. Faith and glory. We're called to trust him with stuff that looks like rubbish. That looks like nothing's happening. Because he's making sure things does happen, do happen. Things do happen. And uh, glory is what he gets from it. And the Christian should be certainly concerned to show faith and to see God's glory revealed. Let the light shine. Don't be intimidated and hold back. Don't snuff the light out, but exhibit it. Plant that seed even though you have no idea how God will ever get a harvest from it. Do not despise the insignificance of the little bits of sharing your faith and shrink back from planting smallest of seed because we know at least one small seed that leads to big bushes in which the birds of the air find their rest. Jesus sets up his kingdom by not even teaching clearly but by putting the message in enigmatic little parables. And it's only the power of God speaking through his word that's ever going to bring in God's kingdom back that sort of way. Jesus is calling for faith, faith that puts its life on the line and goes about sharing his message of his kingdom, trusting God himself to do the job with means as weak as you and me. How strong do you feel today? Aren't you thrilled to be in such a big, thriving, bustling congregation today? Because, you know, Llandalo has been hearing the word of God for so long, the place is packed. Mm. Llandalo has been hearing the word of God for so long. Seed is in ground. God knows what comes next. Farmers, people we know, individuals we share our faith with, people at work around us, Seeding ground. Surface appearing simply weed strewn. The kingdom of God is like seed that grows secretly. Next time we'll be looking at the uh, mighty works of Jesus. Mm -hmm.